Good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. My name is Jonathan, and we're going to do something a little bit special for our final um, episode of 2018. I gave a talk back in October in Atlanta and uh, had a great Q&A session with a group of men, and I want to just share some of the comments that I made there. We're also going to be doing a bonus episode that actually has the Q&A part of that talk, but I wanted to just share this with you. It's um, really kind of giving four key elements that are part of, you know, what does it take? What does integrity require? And uh, this is really just trying to inspire and encourage men to live into their design as men of integrity. And, you know, as we're closing out this year, I just want to remind you, um, you know, that we are a listener-supported broadcast. As we as we come into these last few days of the year, um, if you would like to come alongside and partner with us with a generous year-end contribution, that would bless us so much. You know, we went into this uh, end of the year with a $75,000 need to be able to really finish out the year strong and be able to get into 2019 with momentum and keep all of our programs and services up and running. And, uh, m- you know, some of that, much of that uh, need has been whittled away, but we still have uh, more to go. And so in these last few days, if you'd like to give to us, just go to puresexradio.com and click on the donate button. It means so much, and it helps us to continue to get this message out to those all around the world. And so we are grateful for your partnership, and I hope that this particular uh, episode blesses you. Take care. Have a wonderful new year. Thank you guys for showing up here. All right, so everybody smile. I got to get a picture here so that I can I can post to my Facebook page all the uh, sexually broken men of Atlanta. Okay, so just kidding. I'm, I didn't take a picture. I promise. Uh, I always know that. I, listen, let's just be honest. There's there is an awkwardness to whenever we're in a, a situation like this, right? I think I think, and I'll be honest. The reason I think there's the awkwardness is because we all know our own histories, right? <laughs> And if the reality is that all of us are broken in some way, and we could even make the argument all of us are sexually broken in some way, whether that be by our own sin or by what somebody else's sin was dumped into our life, that's what I think creates that sort of awkward tension around this subject matters. Like to step into a room like this, you're sort of feeling like I'm admitting to something. And I think that's healthy. It's healthy to have the awkwardness. It's healthy to have the admission. It's also healthy for us to just kind of take a deep breath and just go, listen, we're all in this thing together. What I hope we can do through this Q&A time is really start to unpack what does it look like to really take these principles and apply them as men? And then also, what does it look like if we understood that we're all far more alike than we are different? I think we live in a culture that loves to point out differences, loves to point out all the ways in which we're different. And like Julie was even saying earlier about sometimes the way we even seek to minister to one another is highlighting all of our differences. Hey, send the porn guys over here. Send the guys who've had affairs over here. Send the same sex guys over here. Send the, you know, fill in the blank with whatever it is. And so what ends up happening is you don't have any kind of cross community among all of these broken individuals. And so what we want to try to do here is build a sense of unity and also be able to try to answer any specific questions that you have. Before we dive into the Q&A session part, I do want to try to tie together some of these elements of what does it look like as men to actually walk out this design by God to be men of integrity. You know, Julie kind of gave us the the collective, hey, high level, sort of in, what does integrity look like for everybody? I want us to start kind of drilling this down into what it looks like as men. And the the first characteristic, now some of these are going to overlap, but I want us to, I would love to see how we can make these apply to us as men. I've been working with men for 15 years in our ministry, Be Broken Ministries, and we do a three-day intensive workshop called Gateway to Freedom. We've had hundreds and hundreds of men come through that. And one of the things we teach in that workshop is that the key characteristic 
of a man of integrity when it comes to sexual uh, sexuality might not be what you think it would be. Like if I were to just start polling the room and say, hey, what would you say is the number one characteristic, the number one character trait of a man who is walking faithfully in sexual integrity? Toss out some ideas of what you think the number one characteristic might be. Happy, okay. Spending time in the Bible. Conviction. Immunity. Peace. Accountable. All of these things are awesome, and all of them are included in what is necessary to be a man of integrity. Actually, I think man becomes happy when he becomes a man of integrity. But the number one, like the bedrock characteristic is humility. Humility. And a lot of times we don't tie that. For one thing, a lot of times as men, that is not a term that we associate with manhood. Humility sounds weak to us. Humility sounds like, man, are you kidding me? That doesn't sound like any kind of character trait that I want to actually pursue. That I really, I mean, I want to be strong, right? And in fact, when you, when you begin to unpack what it means to be a reflection of the holiness of God, what it, what it really calls us to be, to be men of integrity, there's a deep humility. And the way we can experience that humility is we have to embrace and own our brokenness. I think a lot of times what we want to do is, I know this was my experience, I want to be able to, number one, ignore my brokenness. I don't want to have to actually bring it out. I want to be able to find other ways to to be strong and these kind of things and pretend that I've got it all together. The other thing I don't want to do is I don't want to, I don't want to have to own all of the things that I did. I want to be able to make some kind of excuse about it. And one of the things that I know I like to do was I like to say, really, it's all Adam's fault, right? <laughs> Let's blame Adam. I want to pass the buck. I want to pass not only the buck of blame to someone else, I then actually want to pass the buck of responsibility for my integrity to someone else. I see this happen in counseling. I see this happen in support groups where men are saying, you fix me. Like in other words here, I'm going to be honest with you. I'll tell you what I've done, but at the end of the day, I don't really want to have to make the decisions that I have to make in order to live as a man of integrity. I don't want to actually have to admit and say I was wrong. I don't want to have to actually say, call sin, sin. I want to say it was a mistake. It was, you know, a little error. I don't, you see what I'm saying? Humility is not easy to embrace, but it's essential in order to be a man of of sexual integrity. We have to humble ourselves. I think we have to humble ourselves certainly before God, but we also have to humble ourselves before other men and be able to say, here's me and all of my brokenness, and I want to try to unpack this, not in a way that glorifies sin, not in a way that gets graphic about all kinds of details, but in a way that says, what happens if we as men came together and says, here's my struggle, here's my struggle. Let's try to encourage each other towards a life of integrity. So humility is a key characteristic. I want to share with you a, a passage from 1 John. We might be familiar with this. It's, you know, we, we often associate it with the idea of confession, right? 1 John 1, 9. But I want to read actually verses 5 through 10 of 1 John chapter 1. It says this, This is the message we've heard from him, meaning Jesus, And proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. There's a lot in there. I'm not going to unpack the whole thing. But that is dripping with a need for humility. You can't do any of that 
walk in the light, confess, you know, uh, do any of this stuff where you're admitting to the realities of what you've done. You can't do any of that without humility. If we want to try to continue to have a position where I'm trying to present myself as something other than I am, which is saying that's deceptive. In other words, if I'm saying I don't really have any sin, in other words, I'm not a sinful being, then he says we're deceiving ourselves. If I then say I've never committed sin, it's saying, well, then you're actually disagreeing with the word of God because God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we have to embrace humility to admit, okay, I not only have sin in my being, I'm a sinful creature, but I've also committed sin. And what I love about this is how this actually draws us into community. We live in a Western culture that loves to highlight the individual, don't we? Everything's about the individual, individual rights, individual this, individual that. We have taken this passage and made it just about your confession or my confession, right? Let me read it to you again, at least parts of it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If It doesn't say if I confess my sins. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There's a huge collective community aspect to this. And I think that's another thing that requires humility. When's the last time you specifically confessed sin to another man? And I'm not asking you to tell me right now. I'm just saying reflect on that for a little bit. I think if, if that takes a little bit of time for you to think about, or if when you're thinking about the last time you've confessed specifically a sin to another man and you realize that you might have embellished the story or left a few things out, I think that hits on this issue of our struggle with humility. And humility is a key characteristic of being able to live out our design as men of integrity. The next thing that I think is really a key characteristic of a man of integrity is courage. Courage. I'm gonna. We're gonna. I'm gonna talk briefly about this at the very end of our day today with the whole group. But courage is courage is very difficult to do because um, it requires doing something even when you are afraid. Courage doesn't mean you don't have any fear. Courage is meaning you have a clear understanding of what is the right thing to do and you seek to do it no matter what the outcome might be. No matter whether it's going to hurt you personally. I mean, we think about this in terms of times of war, right? Courage is, I got to go into that building and secure that no matter what harm may come to me because there's a greater mission at play here. And I think when you think about what God has called us to live like in the world in which we live, men, it's going to take courage. It's going to take courage for us to not only stand on the truth of God's word, but it's going to take courage for us to tell our stories, isn't it? I mean, we're going to have to be willing to, when God opens a door for us to be able to tell our story to a a brother, to open our mouths and actually tell our story. And that takes both humility and courage, right? I can see it already. There's a little bit of discomfort in here because I'm not telling you things that, you know, you're probably thinking, I want to run out of here and do these things right now. It's challenging, right? It's challenging to think about, okay, humility. I get it. If I think about that long enough, I realize that I don't drift towards humility. None of us drift towards wanting to sacrifice and, and serve others and be humble, We also don't drift towards courage. Now, where we do drift towards as men is control, right? By the way, control and courage are not synonyms. They don't mean the same thing. So I do think we like to then step in and try to control a situation and present ourselves as courageous. But I think courage is always tied to something bigger than ourselves. So if all that you are doing 
is engaging in things that essentially are going to just promote you and make you bigger in your own eyes or in the eyes of others, then I don't think that's a courageous thing. I think that's a controlling thing. Next, I think the truth is essential for us to live as men of integrity. And the truth is the truth. It's amazing to me how in our culture, in our relativistic culture, we've put all kinds of adjectives in front of truth. My truth, your truth, God's truth. You know, we've made, anytime you put some kind of qualifier in front of the word truth, whatever you're thinking of as truth is no longer truth because you've made it have to filter through the qualifier. Truth is truth. So the thing is, we can know that because God is creator, then whatever he has said must be true because everything came from his mouth. Let there be light. And there was light. So therefore, our ultimate source for truth, period, has to be the one who spoke everything into existence. This is where it gets back to the courage piece, right? Because if we're going to be men of truth, we have to have courage not only to state that to others and stand on that as the final authority. Did you know we have to have courage to apply it to our own lives? You know what I have found the most challenging part of my own personal journey as it pertains to this issue of truth? is actually obeying the word of God. I don't really like to die to myself. I don't know about you guys. Maybe everybody in here, all you guys go, that's my favorite thing to do in the morning. I like to get up and say, I'm going to die to myself today. Uh, You know, if any married guys, when the Bible talks about there only being one spouse that is called to go to the point of death for the other, it's not the wife, it's us. And I don't know about you, but there's plenty of days that I don't feel like really dying for my wife. Obedience takes courage, but we've got to stand on the truth. We need to let the truth do its work in our lives, regardless of what it's going to cost us. In other words, the truth, we're told that this very word is a double-edged sword. Dividing bone from marrow, like splitting even our intentions of our heart, where even if we're doing the right thing with the wrong motives, God says, you got to let my truth cut that out of you. You got to let my truth change your motives. So again, this is kind of building on each other. You've got humility that causes us to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to admit I'm broken. I'm going to own it. Now I've got to step out in courageous action to say, now I'm going to confess this to a brother. I'm going to, I'm going to have communal confession kind of thing, which then means where are we going to go together? We got to stand on the truth. We cannot think that it's just based on my feelings, your feelings. What do you want to do today? There's a truth element to it. And then finally, the culmination of a man of integrity is the all encompassing characteristic of love. This is another one of those terms that I think we have, we've either abdicated or allowed to be hijacked by women. In other words, when when you hear the word love, I would venture to guess that most men in here think in terms of that sort of the women's territory, love, that emotion of love or whatever. Part of that is because I don't think we, number one, understand what love actually means, and the other thing is I don't think we're very in touch with our own emotional selves. Uh, I think I saw an emotion wheel here, didn't I, somewhere? Yeah. See, you Hold that up, because I think that's a great tool. You, we didn't plan this. I think that's a great tool. If you've never seen one of these, it's like it's an emotion wheel. And men, we are, we are terrible at this, right, of being able to peg, like, what am I feeling? Yeah, Troy. Cool. Go to the Hope Quest booth, because this might be one of the most valuable things you leave today with, <laughs> is because a lot of guys, you know, you'll say, well, how you, how you doing? How you feeling? And, you know, you get a blank stare. I like, what do you mean how I'm feeling? I'm, I guess I'm a little hungry. You know, I mean, that's basically what you get. I've heard it, I've heard it said, what is it? It's uh, happy, hungry, and horny are the three emotions that men feel, I think is what they said it boils down to. And throw some anger in there, too. 
But anyway, we are actually emotional beings. And if we don't understand what love means, and, and listen, love, love simply means that I am seeking the best for another at my own expense. That's really what love means. It's me looking at you and saying, I'm willing to pay whatever it costs me to ensure that you have the best. Whatever that means, relationally, emotionally, physically, I'm out for your good. And that's a, that's a way to think of love. So guess what? Guys, I think this is an area that we need to excel in. Think of how God has actually wired us. Think of how he's actually made us. I mean, listen, if you just think about us physically, generally speaking, physically, men are stronger than women. What, great, what a great asset that has given us to be able to literally be able to serve someone else in a way that provides for their good when maybe they've got something that they need help with that requires some strength physically. We can, my, my sister, she teaches uh, junior high math. And she's always telling the boys in the class, how are you going to offer your strength today? How are you going to offer your strength today? I love that my sister is instilling that into young boys' minds that God has made them with a strength that they need to use to serve others. So the thing is, we need humility, men. We need courage to step into environments where we can be honest with one another. We need to stand on the truth and encourage one another in the truth. And ultimately, it's for the final goal of serving for the good of others. Now, you might be thinking, golly, this seems, this seems sort of like basic Christian living. Yes, <laughs> that's just it. We have, we're the ones that have sectioned off this issue of sexuality into its own little corner, thinking that it deserves and needs different kind of attention than what God has already put in his word for our lives as a whole. And what we need to do is we need to pull that back into the reality of our discipleship environments where it's like, listen, this is not something that's separate from who you are and needs to be dealt with completely separately it's something that needs to be pulled back in and says, fundamental to your being human is being sexual. And so therefore, when God is talking about what it looks like to reflect him, you can't say everything but my sexuality is how I'm going to engage discipleship. No, humility, courage, truth, love, these are parts of discipleship that we need to make sure are also addressing our areas of sexual brokenness. So I'm going to encourage us, guys. This is, I won't pretend that this is an easy journey, but we are better together and we're more alike than we are different. So if we're willing to start opening up with each other, I think you will see you'll get a ton of help and the encouragement that you need to keep t- taking steps forward in being a better reflection of the character and holiness of God. Well, listeners, I hope that that talk was encouraging to you, that you were really able to take to heart those key elements of what it takes to live uh, as a man of integrity. Um, Ladies, if you're listening, I think there's benefit there for you as well. This obviously was a talk that I gave specifically to men, so it was geared that way. But the issues of truth and courage and humility, and those are things that are, I think, universally applicable to those who are seeking a life of integrity. But if you'd like to dive deeper, if you want more help and you really want to get more tools for living out a life of integrity, please reach out to us. Uh, you can find lots of information through our Pure Community uh, platform. It's just purecommunity.org is a great um site where you can find all kinds of information like groups and counselors and podcasts and intensives and books, all kinds of good resources there. But again, we're glad that you've been with us and we look forward to having you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. Take care. Pure Sex Radio is paid for by Be Broken Ministries. Visit us online at puresexradio.com.